Welcome to this final session. In it, we're going to be reflecting on living well with ourselves. After a salutary greeting, the follow-up question is usually, how are you? Sometimes the reply can be a short reciprocal one. I'm fine. How are you? But how often do we scratch the surface further to really inquire about an individual? In a recent pastoral conversation with a senior colleague, dispatched to inquire how I was coping in lockdown, I was brave enough to ask them how much time did they have, or did they really just want to hear, I'm fine. Which, let's face it, most of us offer when we don't want to get into the deeper stuff. But the reality was that in this situation, the answer was a little bit more complex, and I needed to know whether I could trust the other person Firstly, to keep confidentiality, but secondly, to hold me and my stuff in a mutually supportive manner. Although, how are you is a question most of us are asked by others, it also helps periodically to do an internal review. This is the process of self-awareness. My spiritual director often asks me how I am in my body, in my relationships and in my spiritual life. Sue and David have helped us unpack the first two areas of living well, with God and with others. And in this session, we're going to explore self-care. As Christians, we're not particularly good at self-care, possibly because we're taught a lot about sacrifice. For in Matthew chapter 16, Jesus says to his disciples, whoever wants to be my disciple must deny themselves take up their cross and follow me. St Paul too describes the baptism journey as a process of dying to self and putting God on the throne. In Romans chapter 6 verse 4 he writes, We were therefore buried with him through baptism into death in order that just as Christ was raised from the dead through the glory of the Father, we too might live a new life. However, this does not mean that we should disregard ourselves. The greatest commandment is clear that it's a Trinitarian command to love God, love neighbour and love self. Jesus declared, love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your mind and with all your soul. This is the first and greatest commandment and the second is like it, love your neighbour as yourself. It's when we have no regard for self that problems arise. For example, in the body, if I'm tired, is it due to overwork or lack of sleep? In my relationships, have I, ever had, a, have I had a disagreement with someone, leaving residue anger or unresolved hurt, both of which can lead to frustration or confusing emotions? And in my spiritual life, have I been intentional about my prayer time? The Whole Life Discipleship Programme at Christchurch promotes seven holy habits that overlap, as we've seen in previous sessions. And in the booklet, you can find that it's very clearly laid out as things having daily, weekly or monthly, or annual suggestions. I'm going to start with a daily practice for living well with ourselves. The daily examine is a technique of prayerful reflection on the events of the day in order to detect God's presence and discern his direction for us. The examine is an ancient practice in the church that can help us to see God's hand at work in our whole experience. This method is adapted from a technique described by Ignatius Loyola in his spiritual exercises. St Ignatius thought that the examine was a gift that came directly from God and that God wanted it to be shared as widely as possible. One of the few rules of prayer that Ignatius made for Jesuit order was the requirement that the Jesuits practice the examine twice daily, at noon and at the end of the day. It's a habit that Jesuits and many other Christians practice to this day. This is a version of the five-step daily examine that St Ignatius practice that's very simple. 
invites us to firstly become aware of God's presence. Secondly, to renew, review the past day with gratitude. Thirdly, to pay attention to our emotions. To choose one feature of the day and pray from it. And finally, to look forward to tomorrow. So if I was to set aside some time for this, I would simply, even as much as or a little as time as five minutes. It's time to be still, to be aware of God's presence, just to breathe in the Holy Spirit and to breathe out some distractions. To think back in my mind over the past day, the conversations that I've had, the people that I've met, the things that I've been involved with or enjoyed. And that will help me come to the things that I want to give thanks for. And I might find that there are some things that have niggled at me. And that's when I'm paying attention to my emotions. There might be things that I felt are left unfinished or things that I want to revisit. And that might help me to choose one feature of the day to pray about and to offer it to God. And then I can sleep with a clearer conscience, knowing that I can look forward to tomorrow because I know what I'm going to do. I think this is a really helpful tool for living well with ourselves. It provides opportunity to really pay attention to what's going on inside, as well as giving an outlet for external expression. As night follows day, so do the rhythms of the week promote space for living well within ourselves too. For since the beginning of time there has been a practice of Sabbath, from evening to evening in the Jewish tradition, and then keeping the day of resurrection holy and special for Christians. Practicing Sabbath can be another really valuable time for intentionally living well with ourselves. All work, paid and unpaid, is good and it needs to be boundaried by the practice of Sabbath. Sabbath is a 24-hour block of time in which we stop work, enjoy rest, practice delight and contemplating God. I've recently started putting this sign on my study door on Fridays. I found that I've needed to be intentional about following the four principles of Sabbath as laid out by Peter Sigario. Firstly, to stop. Sabbath is first and foremost a day when we cease all work, paid and unpaid. Hence the no computer screen, emails or texts. On Sabbath we embrace our limits. We let go of the illusion that we're indispensable to the running of the world. We recognise that we will never finish our goals and projects and that God is on the throne, managing quite well in ruling the universe without our help. Secondly, we need to rest. And once we stop and accept God's invitation to rest, we find refreshment. Knowing that God rested after his work of creation, we are to do the same. For on the seventh day, God had finished the work he'd been doing, and on the seventh day he rested from all his work. Then God blessed the seventh day and made it holy, because on it he rested from all the work of creating everything that he had done. We can then engage in activities that restore and replenish us. From napping, hiking, reading, eating good food or enjoying hobbies and playing sports. Resting from unpaid work also requires advanced planning. If I'm have to have any hope of enjoying a Sabbath rest, I need to set aside time during the week to attend to those routine tasks of life that I shouldn't really be doing on the Sabbath. Paying bills, cleaning or fixing something around the house, the weekly shop. Because then I'm free to delight. For after finishing his work in creation, God promised that it was good. This is not an uh, anemic afterthought. Oh well, it's nice to be 
it's nice to have done that but it's a it is good it's a joyful recognition a celebration of accomplishment as part of observing sabbath god invites us to join the celebration to enjoy and delight in his creation and all the gifts he offers in it these innumerable gifts that come to us in many forms including people places and things as part of preparing to practice the sabbath one of the most important questions to consider is what gives me joy and delight this will differ for each of us but part of the sabbath invitation is to enjoy and delight in creation and her gifts hence the centrality of ecology and stewardship in our living well circles I know that I delight in the beauty and grandeur of nature, from the common to the garden, the seaside to star-filled skies. Craig also enjoys his food, so tasting, smelling and savouring the gift of food is a high priority for us on a day off. Through any and every means possible, on the Sabbath we like to feast on the miracle of life with our senses. Finally, contemplate. Pondering the love of God is the central focus of Sabbath. What makes a Sabbath a biblical Sabbath is that it's holy to the Lord. We're not taking time off from God, we're drawing closer to God. Sabbath is an invitation to see the invisible in the visible, to recognise the hidden ways God's goodness is at work in our lives does not mean we necessarily spend the entire day in prayer or studying scripture, though those activities may be part of a Sabbath day. Instead, contemplation means that we're acutely focused on those aspects of God's love that come to us through so many gifts from his hand. Scripture affirms that all creation declares his glory. Psalm 19 verse 1. And on the Sabbath, we intentionally look for his grandeur in everything from people, food, art, to hobbies and music. In this sense, contemplation is an extension of delight. We are intentional about looking for the evidence of God's love in all the things that he has given us to enjoy. For me, that could be going to an art gallery or just taking time out to create photos with my camera. Now, don't get the impression that I'm daily doing the examine, nor rigorously keeping Sabbath. Both are techniques I need to practice. Clergy are encouraged to have one rest day per week, and although there is a school of thought that this should be extended, as most people get a two-day break from work, what I am a little bit better at is a monthly quiet day. A quiet day is time to be away from the demands of your usual daily life, to stop, reflect and be refreshed. It will give you some time and space to explore your spiritual life and deepen your relationship with God through silence, reflection and prayer. A group quiet day is usually themed with a leader giving short presentations and resources to provide guidance and structure like we have tried to create today. However, you can simply spend a day on your own at a retreat venue too. Somewhere you find refreshing as it's preferable to go away and put the distractions of home aside. We all lead busy and stress-filled lives, causing us to feel as though we're on a constant treadmill of never-ending activity for whatever varied and good reasons. To enjoy a hobby, to read a good book, or simply to sit can feel like a luxury, and that will simply have to wait until we're less busy. No one, it seems, had a more pressurised ministry than Jesus. Everywhere he went, the crowds were following him, demanding his attention, hanging on his every word. Add to that the undercurrent of constant sniping by the authorities and the pressure of just three years to train a mixed bag of disciples, to take on the world-changing strategies for mission, it seems that even more amazing that he nevertheless consistently found time to get away quietly. He would often go off by himself to pray. 
This was a necessity. And each time Jesus took time out, it prepared him for what lay ahead. If Jesus felt this need, how much more do we need to take time to come away from our own situations, to be still and quiet, to reconsider what our priorities need to be, to let God speak into our own lives? I find that it is no coincidence that when I stop for rest or recreation, I end up being recreated. God reveals new truths or pleasures that inspire and uplift. Holidays, therefore, can sometimes feel like an opportunity to really think and gain new perspective or ideas. I think the staff team secretly dislike it when I come back off holiday because I've come back with 101 new things for them all to do. Pilgrimage and festivals, too, are occasions for learning, discovering more about myself and what God wills for my life. I'm often very good at giving advice rather than taking it. There are times in my life when I have not lived well with myself, others or God. And the ultimate mantra or piece of advice that I would give to others is that you can't nurture others unless you nurture yourself. You can't nurture others unless you nurture yourself. This, for me, is the essence of living well with myself. So if I have a healthy diet and take regular exercise, I will feel fitter and more positive. If I take time out to nurture myself, I'm more able to inspire and encourage others. I have peace of mind. If I pay attention to my emotions and invest in my relationship, I have understanding and empathy that enriches my interactions. When I cooperate with God in the garden or give back out of the abundance that he has given me, I feel I am making a difference and that boosts my confidence and self-esteem. Living well with myself is going to be a lifetime's adventure. But I know that when I let my heart's desire be in tune with the loving heartbeat of the Creator and in harmony with creation, then the God who knows me by name and loves me and sets me free, free to be myself. That's a truly remarkable thing, to know how much God sets us free to be ourselves that he wants us to live well with ourselves. Questions that I think might be helpful for further reflection following this session include the things that bring you joy and nurture your own well-being. Try to identify them. What are those things that really make your heart sing and nourish your soul? Are there things that you want to do more of? Or others that you wish to stop to improve your own personal, mental or emotional well-being? I encourage you in the time that's available to spend time reflecting on these final two questions. There's also a handout that goes with this session that gives you more details about the examine and some concluding questions for the whole day that will help us as we come together in our final prayer time and wrapping up session. So often this time in the afternoon is a time for rest. So I encourage you to take some time now to set aside opportunity for living well with yourself.